Cool. Um, I was afraid that I muted. Um, so um, I'm here to talk about one of my favorite architectural patterns, uh, back ends for front ends, and also kind of touch on a little bit into the land of what I like to call unintentional front end microservices, um, which you might um, end up curating or um, kind of working with. So a little bit about me, I'm currently an engineering manager. I'm a front end focused full stack engineer mostly focusing on Ruby and JavaScript, but I've dabbled in a bunch of other languages that I would never put on my resume. Um, and uh, my background is in history, actually. Um, so let's start off with a little bit of kind of the recent past and also my general history with my perspective on this, which has changed a little bit. Um, just because in the last couple weeks, some of my more negative opinions have actually mellowed out. Um, so this, uh, I've given this talk internally and that was, um, and externally a couple times and I feel like it's kind of um, really transformed in the last couple weeks because there's been some developments that have really changed my mind back actually, which is always exciting to have your kind of um, opinion shift because of the, uh, seeing something actually really work in production or really not work in production. Um, so a little bit of history, how did we get into this situation and um, kind of a prehistory of my involvement in this project is we started out with a server rendered Rails uh, website, which then moved to like an Ember website, which now the Ember website still exists, but there's a couple other implementations in Vue and also, um, which my team doesn't interact with too much um, in React. Um, so that's kind of, which sounds a little bit overwhelming, but this is how I think the kind of biggest focus is the goal of this pattern and the goal of kind of conceptualizing this pattern is to hopefully make it a little less overwhelming. Um, so what, how actually is this implemented? Um, we use GraphQL to provide a standardized interface using TypeScript and Node. So um, we have our typing in JavaScript, and, um, so we don't have to worry as much about that. Um, also, GraphQL provides a lot of typing. Um, and also, we use a gateway service, which communicates with both other services that exist and potentially other microservices using REST, GraphQL, gRPC. And honestly, it's kind of et cetera because the client does not have to know a ton about it. Like, the client doesn't need to know a lot about these individual details. They're kind of um, abstracted away. So that's kind of something that's really useful about have, using this pattern is the client doesn't have to have as many details. So um, quick overview of GraphQL. Um, some of the main terms that I'll probably use a ton and probably already used a ton and made this slide may have come in handy a little bit earlier. Um, so uh, the main things to worry about with GraphQL that we'll be talking about today are schema. Um, and I have an example of type cat because if you hadn't noticed from the previous slides, I'm a huge fan of cats. Um, and uh, so defining that type cat which then has the uh, coloring, um, which the options are calico, tor I actually had no idea that's how you spell tortoiseshell and tabby. Um, and then I have an example of a resolver and um, that's the cat resolver. Um, so, and then I don't have any examples of queries, but we'll get to that very shortly. Um, so I think kind of the question in the back of my mind when I first heard about this, and I think when a lot of people hear about this pattern as well is why? Like, why do I care about this? Why is this something that like I should be interested in using? And I've seen a bunch of hot takes about like this is you know a lot. Like why are we doing this kind of thing? Um, so I'm going to show a kind of an abstracted um, potential architecture that you might run into these days, where we have our three web apps, we have our gateway service, we have our main REST service, we have a GraphQL service, and where it starts to get kind of interesting is not only is web app 2 talking to the gateway service, it's also talking to the GraphQL service, and the gateway service is also talking to the GraphQL service. And you're like, but why? <laughs> like, where is this coming from? But why? Um, so I think that's kind of important sometimes is some of this is tech debt. Some of this is potential opportunities to optimize. Like maybe we're talking to two different endpoints in the main REST service or that might be abstracted into a different subdomain so that we can migrate things out later. And maybe one of these other web apps is deprecated. So there's kind of some like institutional history to the why of all of this. And this is one of the ways that this pattern really helps kind of um, put a uh, 
kind of a bow on it, I guess. So it's more of a, uh, rather than all of these different uh, lines that are connecting to each other. So um, why white union trip might, uh, besides the opportunity to kind of uh, unravel some of those uh, potential, um, I always kind of think of like the dartboard with all of the things connecting um, when I see that architectural diagram. So like, what are some of the advantages of back end for front end pattern? Um, so one thing that I talked about earlier is the front end can be relatively agnostic to the data's end format, the destination. Like the, the front end doesn't need to know a ton about what's happening with a lot of the other microservices. So like what the query might look like is service A might ask for a hero with name, but service B, um, when we actually get that data from service B, maybe it looks like display name. Um, and maybe it's, we don't even know about heroes yet. So this is something that we might end up transforming. Um, so the client doesn't need to know um, that what the data in service B actually looks like. We only need to know about um, what is happening here with the hero and name. So kind of related to this is you can easily replace where you're ultimately sending the data to, i.e. Um, your hopeful idea that you might swap out the monolith to microservices. We'll touch on a little bit later why this might be kind of more hopeful. Um, and uh, maybe like client A has this same pattern of the query is asking for name, but service B is asking is for in person the same, but maybe we end up using a REST query, like we end up replacing it with a new service, which is RESTful. Like, and, but the client doesn't need to know. The client will still have that same client A format. Like the client doesn't need to know at all. Um, and then one other thing is what happens if clients want different things? And also, should there be different clients? We'll touch on this a little bit earlier, but this is actually one of the points that I was kind of the most, um, not confused about, but like, um, what have gone back and forth on a bit. And I think that I've kind of come to the conclusion that I actually uh, think that um, having a gateway service to serve multiple front end clients is not necessarily an anti pattern. And there might be uh, situations where it's actually really useful. Um, and so you also, you can uh, potentially transform responses for web and mobile or other clients. Um, and also this is another one that like caveat, this can also make errors much harder to interpret. And I may have may or not have run into this in the last week, um, but you can standardize error responses from other services so that the client can only, or might get a uh, standardized response. So we can, that we can really kind of interpret and handle and have a very clear idea of what we want to do with it. So um, also uh, you really can standardize communication to the back end so that only have like one scheme of authentication. So we can talk to the gateway service and then the gateway service can talk to everything else. And we don't need to know how to actually talk to those microservices. The gateway service will handle it for us. Um, and also this sounds really cool. And I always think that it's one of my favorite features, but I've never actually used it. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to an opportunity to use it, but it's, you can potentially request from multiple servers in parallel to get what the front end needs. Um, so that would be really cool. So the gateway service can talk to multiple services and then kind of construct a response to get the data to the front end. Um, I really want to use this at some point and I came very close to having a use case recently. I was very excited. All right, but some of the disadvantages. Um, this one is one that is I, actually another one that I've kind of mellowed on. Um, it is additional complexity for every call. You're potentially adding a new endpoint and cognitive overhead every single time you just want to make a call to something that might already exist. So it's a little bit like, okay, we have to do what to get this data? Like it's a little bit um, uh, additional overhead. But um, I think that the advantages at this point kind of outweigh this particular disadvantage. Um, also, you're potentially passing lots of information from service to service, um, which I've seen at one point uh, people talk about like, talking to two or three different services to pass that data along, which um, you're kind of adding that additional latency every time you talk to a different service. And also, uh, this one, I think is one that I always keep in the back of my mind, but logic might end up finding a new home in your gateway service, um, which you probably don't want to do. You probably want it to live in its own microservice or somewhere else, but it's really tempting to, if you're adding an endpoint, let's just, you know, do some additional logic in the endpoint. 
Um, and it's something that you kind of have to constantly keep in mind. Um, and this is my kind of additional outcomes category, which I kind of are like neither pros nor cons, things that might end up sliding into advantages or disadvantages at some point. Um, multiple front end microservices or clients sharing the same gateway service. Um, this is one that I originally had in a disadvantage, but I've actually really kind of come around to in the last couple weeks. I think that there are opportunities if that client is really um, sharing kind of a different interpretation of the same data, it might actually really make sense. And uh, the overhead of breaking it out into two different gateway services might be completely unnecessary. And also, um, this is one thing that is kind of in the back of my mind is GraphQL uh, Apollo client uh, really allows this thing called schema delegation, which is a really cool way of you talking to another GraphQL server. And every single time um, I'm involved in writing an endpoint that just talks to another GraphQL server, I'm like, hmm, we really should try this at some point. Um, so this is one thing that like, I'm kind of, but on the same hand, it's like, okay, there's a lot of disadvantages that we might end up not being able to use if we end up doing this. So it's kind of one thing that like, it might be fun to try, but I'm not entirely sure that we're ready to commit to it yet. And also, um, it somewhat encourages proxying to existing code rather than fully replacing. Like if you have the opportunity to just talk to an endpoint that already exists and it's in a service that you might want to start kind of deprecating or moving elsewhere, it's really easy to be like, okay, we have the data. We'll just deal with the rest of it later. Someone else might clean things up. So um, this one is one that I have personally been guilty of. Um, so, uh, and also if this is, only being built for one front end endpoint is GraphQL overkill. Like GraphQL is really useful if you want to um, ask for particular data and get only a certain um, subset back. But if we're always building um, basically like a GraphQL resolver for every single um, individual page, it really becomes kind of like a REST endpoint. So like, are, are we using GraphQL effectively? Um, so these are all the kind of questions I like to always ask. Um, I like to kind of be super interrogative with our architecture and kind of always, I have a list of like things that I might want to eventually change. Um, but yeah, so that kind of is a great segue into what would we do if we started from scratch? Like, okay, um, if we had an opportunity to build a gateway service from scratch again, like what would that gateway service end up look like? Um, I think that one thing for the like improved gateway service, we'd probably end up using um, more extensive, uh, more extensively rely on Apollo, um, which is a provides a lot of client side libraries, and they also have um, REST data source and a schema delegation and all these other cool features that we're just not taking advantage of. Um, we do a lot of um, handled things that it's like that both means that like everyone who onboards has to kind of learn the handled things and everyone kind of has to um, maintain them as well. So I think we're kind of, there's a lot of opportunities to kind of learn from what other people have done that we haven't taken an advantage of. So these are what I would recommend everyone else looking into if they are interested in doing the same thing. So cool. Uh, I linked to a bunch of uh, my favorite articles about this pattern, but yeah, that's about it.